Hi everyone, so today we're going to focus on micro microbial symbioses. And when we talk about this today, you're going to encounter a lot of specific relationships. So before we kind of generally mention the types of relationships that can exist, but today we'll go uh, one by one through some really good examples of these symbioses. And I want to make sure that for each of these, know the partners, okay? Know the role of each partner, because that becomes very, very good, easy types of questions for me to ask is, you know, what's the role of this? What's the role of that? Okay? So now just remind me again, what exactly does symbiosis or symbiotic relationships mean? Okay, well, symbiosis is basically any kind of interaction between two different biological species. And it will be a close interaction and usually long term. Now there are three categories that we talked about. There's parasitic, mutual or mutualism, and commensalism. Now, parasitic, the first one, we call that the undergrad one. Uh, parasitic, as we've mentioned before, when there is a parasite, it is causing harm to the host. So the parasitic relationship is where one of the organisms is benefiting, but at the cost or to harm the other. Mutualism is just like it sounds. It's a mutual relationship where both parties benefit. And then commensalism is the one that students tend to forget what it means. Commensalism, which is usually in fungal organisms, that's when one member benefits and the other member is completely unaffected. The other member is not harmed nor helped. So going through some of the symbiotic relationships that can occur. First, we'll look at some that are microbe to microbe, meaning both members are microbes. The first example is lichens, which is a mutualism between a fungus and an algae. And the algae, of course, is a cyanobacterium photosynthetic. Now, in each of the relationships we talk about, I want you to know what the role is for each of the members in that relationship. So in the lichen relationship, Algae, well, we just mentioned that algae is a cyanobacterium, which is photosynthetic. Well, if it's photosynthetic, it's able to produce organic matter and basically provide food for its relationship partner. The fungus, on the other hand, that is providing a structure within which the phototroph, the algae, can grow protected from erosion, okay? Because this relationship is usually found on things like bare rocks, tree chunks, um, various soils. So basically areas where if an algae was trying to chill there all by itself, it would be subject to erosion and be knocked off these various places that it would try to be, okay? So remember in lichens, the algae is photosynthetic and provides food source or organic matter for the fungus. And the fungus is providing a safe structure, basically a nice little house protected from erosion. For the next relationship, which is always fun to say or gives me trouble every time, Chlorochromatium aggregatum. It sounds like a Harry Potter or one of those uh, sci-fi kind of spells that you would hear. So in this one, you find this in fresh water. It's a relationship of mutualism again, okay? And it's usually referred to as a consortia. And in this one, you end up with two members. You have the green sulfur bacteria and you have the flagellated rod. Now, as soon as you see flagellated rod or flagella, this should automatically tell you the role of the rod in that scenario. Flagella, you know, allows for movement. So the fl flagellated rod provides movement for a bacteria that's usually non-motile, okay? So the green sulfur bacteria, the non-motile bacteria now, 
tends to be an obligate anaerobic phototroph again. So you see the word green highlighted on here. This sulfur bacteria is a phototroph. And what did we just say about phototrophs? Well, they provide a food source, okay? They provide organic matter for the partner. Now what's cool about this one is if you look in the figures and kind of see what's happening, you have a flagellated rod that's in the center of the consortia. And then you have all of these green sulfur bacteria that, you know, basically attach on, grab on. So you end up with this big structure, this consortia, where you have the non-motile green uh, bacteria attached to that flagellated rod, and now you get a movement possible. And basically, this is very close, intimate contact of them. There's suggestions that they even fuse their periplasms uh, between themselves and that it helps facilitate the transfer of nutrients from that phototrophic green sulfur bacteria to the flagellated rod. Now, when we talk about the, um, the microbial symbiotic relationships, you can also have plants involved. So plants can be a microbial habitat, basically, and we'll talk about mutualism example of the legume root nodules, okay? So first off, when you hear the word legume, what, you know, examples you could think of, well, these are things like soybeans, peas, all of those kinds of uh, yummy little foods that you've encountered before. And a lot of times on these kinds of plants, you find these uh, these nodules, these, these rhizobia growing all over them. And these are very important because they're nitrogen fixing bacteria. And when you hear nitrogen fixing or nitrogen fixation, basically nitrogen is needed for plants and animals. And if you remember, if I, you've ever heard me say NAN, N-A-N, that's to remind you that nitrogen is needed for plants and animals to make amino acids, which are for their proteins, and nucleic acids, so their DNA. Now, the nitrogen in the atmosphere is not in a form that they can use. So basically, these bacteria, these bacteria clinging to the plant roots, have to take inert nitrogen in the atmosphere and convert it into useful, usable nitrogen. Okay. Now, this is very key, uh, especially in food and agriculture. It gives the ability to, you know, grow plants and, and, and food products without nitrogen fertilizer, and that can save millions of dollars yearly and also reduce pollution. So nitrogen fixing bacteria, the rhizobia, are uh, very, very important for, for all of us, basically. Now, this is just to show you the steps in root nodule formation. So you have nod genes. Okay, so oh, let me highlight nod as in N-O-D. So there are genes that produce the, the nod factors and they induce the root hair curling. They trigger plant cell division and they basically signal to the legumes to develop the nodules. Now, you don't have to memorize every step on this figure. I just want you to be aware that when you hear nod factors, N-O-D factors, that these are genes for producing the uh, nitrogen fixing nodules on legumes. Okay, so remember nod factors. Now this is to show you an example of those nod factors at work. So it's showing you that there's basically a signaling cascade and that involves phosphorylation to activate the nod genes to then produce the nodules. So let me just laser pointer this. So you have those nod, 
nod factors um, and you have that phosphorylation over here and the signaling pathway in terms of um, inducing the nod fo nodule formation. But I'm not going to go through the ultra specifics like the calcium channeling and all of that. You don't need to know all of the, the format that you see on this slide because this is in biochemistry. I just want you to be aware that MIC, so MIC and NOD, when you see these, just know that they're involved in nodule formation. You don't have to know how, just know that NOD and MIC are involved in nodule formation for rhizobia. Now what's interesting with those rhizobia is they multiply very, very quickly within the plant cells and you end up with this structure here, this bacterioid, and the bacterioid is simply this swollen kind of branched out uh, structure of cells. And with that, you end up getting um, basically groupings of these bacterioids that are surrounded by the plant membranes. And that then forms a symbiosome that's capable of nitrogen fixation because again, these, these bacterioids, these are the rhizobia. Okay, so it has the nitrogen fixation uh, ability. But now what's interesting then is the plant that's infected by the rhizobia, the nitrogen fixing bacteria, once that plant dies, the nodules that we saw in the previous pictures around the roots then deteriorate because the plant has died. Once the nodules deteriorate, they then release these bacterioids, right? And those bacterioids now are in the soil. Now on their own, they wouldn't be, in, uh, they'd be incapable of division, but a small number of dormant rhizobial cells always remain present in these nodules that are deteriorating. Those then proliferate because they use the deteriorating nodule around them as nutrients basically to feed themselves. And then, they're able to um, initiate infection either in the next season or they can just stay free living in the soil and they'll have the decomposing matter around them to help kind of feed off of and survive. Okay, so when you see bacterioids, make sure that you know that these are those swollen, misshapen, kind of weird looking cells of rhizobia and that they then form their sim the symbiosome structure. So a whole bunch of my, uh, bacterioids kind of covered in a plant cytoplasmic membrane. And then once the plant dies, ultimately the bacterioids can either initiate infection of another plant or they can stay free living in the soil. Now, regarding plant and microbe relationships, it's not just legumes and it's not just those rhizobia. There are a lot of um, non-legume plants that can also end up having nitrogen fixing relationships with bacteria that are not necessarily rhizobia. But just remember the concept that, you know, plants need nitrogen for making their proteins, making their DNA. So they like to find a bacteria that can help them do this. So another example is the Azola cyanobacteria, which you'll find in rice patties, enriching them, and the Frankia bacteria, okay, that, that help with alder trees. And then a reminder of our favorite parasitic symbiosis between bacteria or microbe and plants. And that is our good old friend, Agrobacterium tumefaciens. okay? So again, anytime you see one of those big clumps sticking out of a tree trunk, out of uh, any kind of tree branch, that tells you that that tree, that plant has been infected by Agrobacterium tumefaciens. okay? And what's interesting is tumefaciens is actually a relative of the root nodule the rhizobia.
and as you can see in these figures, you'll have the plant, you will have a wound site. So remember we said if the plant gets a cut in it or the tree gets a cut in it, the bacteria will basically attach to the wound site and they'll make these cellulose microfibrils, these little, you know, picture them as little extensions grabbing a hold of that wound and they'll transfer part of the TI plasmid to the plant cells. And you see in this little figure here that they're doing the DNA transfer via these uh, VIR encoded proteins. So when you see VIR encoded proteins, know that that's basically how the uh, TI plasmid is able to then enter the plant cells. Okay, so it's basically kind of codes for having an enzyme cut the plasmid and then transfer it through from through through the agrobacterium membrane across through the plant cell wall and uh, to get the tDNA that we've spoken about before uh, into the plant cell. Okay, and then you end up with that uncontrolled growth. Now, there's also mutualism. There is the mutualism of the micro, I, I always mispronounce the mycorrhiza, uh, fungi and plant roots. There are two classes when it comes to the mycorrhiza. And again, whenever you hear the word myco, M-Y-C-O, in uh, microbiology, that tells you that it's a fungus. So for instance, when we talk about mycoses, those are fungal infections. Okay, so when you see mycorrhizae, that tells you it's a fungus, and this one's infecting plant roots. There are the ectomycorrhizae and the endo. So ecto, those have the fungal cells uh, with an extensive sheath around the outside of the, the, the plant root, and there's very little penetration. You basically, you usually find these in forest trees. Whereas the endo, so when you hear endo, think inside of, these are where the fungal hyphae, they end up becoming very deeply embedded into the root tissue. These are the ones that are much more common and you find in basically over 80% of terrestrial plants. So when you see ectomycorrhizae versus endo, think endo within, so the roots, the, the, the roots of the fungi, the hyphae will really get embedded in deep within the, the root tissue, whereas ecto is more of a surface infection, okay? But they're both getting their, um, their assistance from this relationship, which you'll see in the next slide. So the mycorrhizae, so the fungi, what they're doing to assist plants is basically by, by having their network of hyphae, you know, those little extensions that fungi have sticking out like a whole bunch of hands, that's increasing the surface area around the root system. And so that will help the plant increase nutrient absorbent, uh, absorption. They also help promote plant diversity by, you know, if, if you look at this figure here, you know, once you have that increased nutrient absorption, you're going to end up with distinctions amongst the plants. Now, as interesting as plants are, you know, we always care about mammals a little bit more because we're getting closer to what humans use or have. So now we'll go through mammals as microbial habitats or uh, relate symbiotic relationships. So when you look at this slide, you get to see that a big thing with regard to our symbiotic relationship with microbes is going to involve the different diets of, uh, of mammals and of organisms or animals. And so this reminds you that there are herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. So the herbivores are the plant eaters, the carnivores are the meat eaters, and the omnivores are those of us that will be eating both plants and meats. 
Now, when you think about eating plants versus meats and, and the different diets that mammals can have, when you think of the mammalian gut, we are able to eat plants thanks to microbes. Because even with humans, for instance, we would not be able to digest the fibers of plants, basically the cellulose, that very strict, uh, strong structure carbohydrate of the plants, we wouldn't be able to properly digest if we didn't have microbes in our gut. Now, there are two digestive plans that help the herbivore animals with regard to digesting plants, okay? Um, you have foregut versus hindgut fermentation. And with foregut, the fermentation chamber basically precedes or is in before the small intestine. So ingested nutrients are degraded by gut microbes before they encounter acidic stomach uh, digestion. Okay, so foregut happens before the stomach. Hindgut, what they end up using is the cecum and the large intestines. These will be animals that only have one stomach, but they have the organ called the cecum between the intestines to then ferment the, um, the kind of plant, the plant fibers, okay? And ultimately, these, the, this, this organ will have um, fiber and cellulose digesting microbes, okay, to help the animal break things down. Now, with those differing uh, fermentation and um, uh, gut kind of organisms, you end up having ruminant animals and what ruminant animals, they are an example of the four gut fermenters that we just mentioned. So the idea of having this fermentation before you end up getting to, uh, let's say the acidic stomach. These are usually herbivores, okay? Things like cows or four gut uh, fermenters, they're ruminant animals. And they basically have a special digestive organ called the rumen. And within that, you'll have these microbes that help with the fermentation or breakdown of things like cellulose or those very, um, very strong carbohydrate structures that are found in plants. Now, in the rumen, you have a massive amount of those microbes, and they're basically... Um, considered celluloidic or cellulolytic uh, microbes because think about it, they're breaking down cellulose, okay? So when you see the term hydrolyzing cellulose, they are breaking down uh, cellulose, usually through the usage of water molecules, okay? And when you look at these, like we said, whenever you see the rumen, Think of animals like cows, sheep, and goats using this. The rumen is ultimately very important for these organisms because the microbes in here, by breaking down the cellulose, they then allow fatty acids to pass through the rumen wall into the animal's bloodstream. And that's important because the animal then uses fatty acids for building their fats, their oils, and even their cell membranes. So it's a very important building block for the animal, and they wouldn't be able to obtain it without the help of these microbes in the rumen that are cellulolytic to break down cellulose. Now, it's horrible that I actually find this, um, this slide kind of funny because the rumen we just said, this extra organ is filled with a whole bunch of these microbes that are helping that organism to break down and obtain nutrients from plants. Now, the rumen microbes, in addition to breaking down cellulose, are helping that animal to synthesize amino acids and vitamins. But the part that always makes me laugh is the fact that these microbes can also directly serve as protein as I put on that bullet point, 
Now, why do you think that is? What does that mean that the microbes can directly serve as protein? It means that the animal can digest those microbes if it needs, you know, extra protein. So not only do the microbes help in terms of their fermentation processes, but they can actually be a direct source of food or nutrients for that animal as well because the animal can digest some of them. And there are so many of those microbes in there. And you know from class how quickly microbes, especially bacteria, um, replicate so they can easily get replaced if the animal is constantly digesting some of those microbes. Now what's also interesting is that abrupt changes in that animal's diet can ultimately lead to changes in the rumen flora. And so I show here in this figure one of the phylogenetic types of figures that we've seen in other uh, lectures from this course already. Now, normally the rumen contains between 300 to 400 bacterial species, so meaning different types of bacteria. But what's interesting is that in addition to the, the bacteria, the flora also includes some anaerobic protists and fungi that are very abundant and have metabolisms similar to the bacteria that you would also find here. But now, like I mentioned, things like changes in the animal's diet or in the animal's health, for instance. So make a little start of yourself. Changes in the bacteria's, I'm sorry, changes in the animal's diet or changes in the animal's health can cause the flora, the, the rumen microbe diversity to change, okay? And one of the biggest things that gets affected when the, you know, percentages or the, the representations of these species changes is what we call acidosis. You can get an acid, acidification within that rumen, okay? And then that can cause problems or, or change the, you know, um, the benefit of the rumen for that organism. Now, enough of the animals that don't matter to us. Actually, they do. They taste delicious. But anyway, now we move on to the important animal, the human. And you've probably heard the term human microbiome already. So when you hear the term human microbiome, that basically means all of the microbes living on or in the human body. Okay, so define the microbiome as all of the organisms, the sorry, all of the microbes living on or in the human. Now, what's the benefit of this? Well, one of the big ones we've already mentioned is our GI tract. Okay, we have a monogastric GI tract, and we rely on mutualism, the idea of having microbes helping us digest things. And this slide is to kind of summarize that idea, the idea that these gut microbes, they're our besties. They produce enzymes and, and produce um, building blocks for us that we require. Like I mentioned before, you know, things like breaking down plants, uh, the, the plant cellulose would not be possible for us if we didn't have these lovely microbes within our GI tract. Now what's interesting is you get this colonization at birth and then you end up with a succession of microbes replacing each other throughout adulthood. And they're really, valuable for us because they express genes whose products then help us um, catalyze various you know, nutrients. Like I said, cellulose being a big one of them. They help us with the uptake of the nutrients and all kinds of metabolic breakdowns. Now, what's also really interesting about our gut microbes is that now um, they're actually linked to things like obesity so there may be a link with the composition, kind of like we just talked about in the previous slide, how you have different diversities or different um, phylogenetics of the types of bacteria present 
Well, we have that too. Person to person, your microbes can be very different. And, you know, they're now linking the idea to obesity and, you know, whose gut microbes have different abilities to harvest energy from the diet or whose gut microbes have increased conversion and absorption of fermentable substrates. You know, if these guys are helping us with our metabolic breakdown and everybody has slightly different gut compositions, they're actually finding, kind of like you see in the figure here, different gut compositions with lean animals versus obese animals. You know, having more of certain bacterial species and less of others can, you know, determine uh, how we're going to be handling our food and nutrients. Uh, what's interesting is not only can they be connected with obesity, but we can also, kind of like I mentioned in the previous slide, you can see big changes from person to person based on things like pregnancy, uh, based on things like your diet, and even your health, okay? Think about it. When we go through learning about bacteria, each bacterial species has different needs, different, you know, optimums, different uh, preferences with regard to things like sugar, salt, all of that. So even things like how active you are can affect, you know, these the, the microbe composition. But make sure you're familiar with why these microbes are so important to us. They can, you know, the, the production of those enzymes and amino acids is very significant. Now, as we've kind of touched upon in class and lab as well, your gut isn't the only area that has microbes. They are coating your body and they are in every little orifice, orifice of your body, which I know is lovely to picture that you have bacteria all over you right now. Um, but two of the other big ones other than your GI tract are the relationships you have with microbes in your oral cavity as well as your skin. And so in the oral cavity, we've mentioned this one a lot, you have a whole lot of plaque, right? So that counts as part of these microbial communities, their, their oral uh, habitat. And what's interesting is in your oral cavity, you have at least 750 species, including bacteria and yeast. Although you do have antifungals in your saliva, so it does minimize the amount of um, fungal growth that you should have in your mouth. The big chunk of the oral cavity microbes, you know, are biofilms. Specifically, we say plaque. And anytime you see the word biofilms, I want you to remind yourself, what does this mean? Right? It's a whole collection of different species of bacteria sticking together. And sticking because a lot of them have, what's that structure? A glycocalyx. Now, in addition to the oral cavity, you also have the skin. And when you think of the functions of the skin, the biggest function of the skin is being part of your immune system. Your skin is part of your innate immune system, meaning the born with it immunity that tries to protect you from any and all microbes without even identifying them first. Its main function of skin is protection for you. And your skin, just like with the oral cavity, is coated with bacteria and yeast, which you got to visualize when we did the lab with the handprint. Now, whenever you think of these microbial communities, you have to ask yourself, well, ew, why do I have these microbes covering my skin or all around in my mouth, well, remember, they're normal flora. They're trying to help you the bulk of them, okay? Microbial antagonism, they are preventing the bad guys from being able to take over. Now, as I mentioned previously, okay, you can have a lot of changes in the composition of the microbiomes. So the variety, the diversity of the bacteria and fungi that are present on or in your body. Now, the two main things that can affect it are not only diet, but disease. 
your health, okay? So with your health, if you are now diseased, that basically means that your body may not be the most preferable or optimal condition for a lot of your microbiome. So for instance, certain things within disease or illness can kill off a lot of your microbiome or your normal flora. And then what happens? What do you know about when some of your normal flora is killed off? Well, now the bad guy pathogens can th thrive or flourish and take over. Okay. Now, one of the examples that we use regarding disease in the human microbiome is IBD, irritable bowel disease. Okay. Now, that is not caused by a um, specific pathogen, but it's usually by an imbalance between the, hum the human immune system and the normal gut flora. Okay. So now, when you think of this kind of problem, there's usually reduced functional capacity of the gut microbiome with fewer, what we call, I know you're going to get upset when I mention genetics, fewer non-redundant bacterial genes. So they're basically finding in IBD patients that their gut microbiome does not have as many of the gene variety that you would like to help you properly digest, break down, and absorb nutrients, because we said that's the purpose of the gut normal flora, okay? So they're finding different genes and different makeup in IBD patients. So sometimes the alterations in the microbiome is not uh, caused by the disease. Sometimes it's a it's, it's what can be linked to causing the problem in the, in the disease as well. Now, one of the terms I want you to know is dysbiosis, okay, dysbiosis. And what that is, is a disruption of homeostasis between microbiota and host, okay? So write down dysbiosis is a disruption of homeostasis between the microbe or the microbiome and the host. And that's kind of like what I just mentioned in IBD. You end up with a disruption in the IBD patients of their gut normal flora, and you end up with the relationship not really doing what it's supposed to. Now, humans and animals are not the only ones that can house microbes. Insects can as well. And what's interesting is to point out that insects are the most abundant class of animals living today. They are all over the place, right? And I find that little guy on, on here kind of cute, both of them. Um, what's interesting is that in a lot of the cases, the microbes that are living within or on insects uh, it's a mutual relationship, just like with our symbiotes that are, you know, helping us digest and whatnot. Now, what's interesting in terms of how these insects get their um, their transfer of the of the microbes. So, what this means is how they get their transfer, how the insect gets infected with those microbes. Now I'm saying infected, but again, keep in mind it's a mutual good relationship. So an insect can either get their microbes from horizontal transmission or vertical transmission. And whenever we talk about vertical transmission in microbiology, we do the same in terms of medical and humans. Vertical transmission, picture a baby plopping out of a mom, okay? As she's standing out, just plops right out. Okay, vertical transmission means that they have gotten this microbe from their parent. It's heritable. And if they're getting the microbe from their parent, those are usually obligate, um, obligate symbi symbionts, meaning that they lack a free living replicative stage. They can't properly survive outside of that insect. They have to be in that symbiotic relationship. Now, transmission can also be horizontal with 
insects, what horizontal transmission means is they get the microbe from the environment. Call it an environmental reservoir. In humans, when we talk about horizontal transmission, we mean sex. Okay, but in insects, we mean it's picking these microbes up from the environment. So, for instance, it ate something in the environment. It ate like part of a leaf and that leaf had the microbes, the bacteria on it, they took them in. Now, when we talk about insects and their bacteria inside of them, they, the, the relationship can either have a primary or a secondary symbiont. Okay, primary, those are required for host reproduction okay so primary very important required for host reproduction they're restricted to what's called their bacteriome which is the specialized region where you have the bacterial cells residing in specialized cells called bacteria sites okay and in the primary um, relationship in primary symbiotes some of the parasitic symbiotes basically have the ability to manipulate the host reproductive tissues. So they're required for host reproduction. Secondary, what that means is it's not required for host reproduction. The microbe is not required for host reproduction. It's not gonna be present in every individual because it's not required. Now, it can basically still um, invade different cells and it's able to survive outside of that host so it's not one of the obligate symbionts and ultimately it needs to provide a benefit now when you think of the benefits that a symbiont can provide there are three main ones i want you to remember it can be nutritional it can be protection from the environment or protection from pathogens Okay, so nutritional, protection from the environment, or protection from other pathogens, kind of like when you think of our own, um, our own normal flora. Now, one of the insects that I know you've probably all heard mention of, especially with regard to kind of their digestive abilities or what they like to digest, which can be quite annoying for the rest of us, um, are termites. And with termites, the way they stand out with regard to compar comparing them with the other insects is that termites don't have intracellular bacteria. Instead, their microbes and their microbiome is actually very similar to the way that humans have, you know, with the, um, the majority being uh, the gut community. Now, with what I just mentioned in terms of what you've heard about termites before, you know, most people, when you hear termites, you think them chewing up the wood in your house, destroying wood, and uh, that's where their microbes actually come in handy for them. Their microbiome is pr primarily responsible for breaking down the wood and the cellulose in the natural environment where the, the termites will be trying to eat these things. Now, they have um, a gut that has a foregut, a midgut, and a hindgut. And the way that um, that's formatted is the midgut is the site of secretion of their digestive enzymes. And it's responsible for the absorption of soluble nutrients. Now their hindgut, that has a whole bunch of microbes and is a major, um, another major site of nutrient absorption. Now, when you have these microbes, the microbe fermentation of carbohydrate products is basically primary, is the primary source of um, carbon and energy for the termites. So having the microbes is very critical for them because as you know, them obtaining carbon and energy is very important for them to be able to then make all of their um, main four biomolecules. So things like, you know, the nucleic acids, the proteins, the carbohydrates, um, and the lipids.
okay? So when you think of termites, remember um, the concept that their microbes are what's helping them break down wood and cellulose and the, um, the mid-gut versus hind-gut, how the hind-gut is where you will find the, the, the microbes that are helping them out. You also have aquatic invertebrates that have microbes within them or that have microbial relationships. Uh, one of them is this really cute looking guy on this page, the Hawaiian bobtail squid. The bacteria that you find um, symbiotically having a relationship with the bobtail squid is the Alivibrio fishery. And when you see the name of that uh, bacterium. So circle that name. Right away you should be able to think, hey, that's the one that's having a mutualistic or, or symbiotic bond with squid for two reasons. This should kind of make you think of that. One, fishery sounds like fish and, you know, thinking fish in the water. Also, Vibrio. Whenever you see Vibrio, that's bacterium that you find in marine environments and aquatic environments. And that's what causes a lot of the uh, shellfish and seafood um, food, uh, foodborne illnesses, sorry. So basically, when you get food poisoning from seafood, clams, things like that, it's usually Vibrio. And when you saw on the news uh, not that long ago, all of those cases of people getting flesh-eating disease from being out in water, having open wounds or being high risk and being out in water, that's also usually Vibrio as well. And their relationship here is basically a mutualistic one. The squid will have a whole bunch of bioluminescent bacterium, the Alivibrio fishery, in a specialized structure which is called their light organ. Now, if you think of that, well, how does that benefit the squid? Well, what happens is those bacteria, the alivibrio fishery, will emit light, and that resembles moonlight penetrating the marine waters. So that actually camouflages the squid from predators. Okay, so the bacteria get to have a nice, safe home in the squid and you know, get nutrients and whatnot from their squid buddy. And the squid gets protection from predators because of the emission of light camouflaging them. So it's a nice, uh, valuable, mutualistic bond. Now with that, um, that symbiotic relationship between the Alivibrio fishery and the squid, this is a highly specific, mutualistic, symbiotic relationship. And the transmission of the bacteria is horizontal, okay? Horizontal, meaning they get the bacteria from the environment, as opposed to vertical would have been from the parent. So the light organ is basically getting these bacteria, filling it up right after the squid has hatched. So it's not from the parent, it's from the surrounding environment. Now the bioluminescence of the bacteria is controlled by something that you are already familiar with, which is quorum sensing. And quorum sensing, remember, they're looking for a quorum. Quorum sensing is when the bacteria will not activate the genes to produce this light or to produce this product until there is a large enough population around it that it would actually be beneficial to them, okay? So the colonization is very important because you, the, the squid needs to build up a large enough population of the bacteria before the bacteria will activate their genes for the bioluminescence, okay? Now, like I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, sorry, when I was explaining the previous slide, the mutualism is that not only does the squid get the benefit of camouflage and the luminescence, but the bacteria gets the benefit of getting nutrients and a st nice stable home within the squid. 
Now, also in the aquatic environment, I want to briefly mention the hydrothermal vent symbioses. Now, you'll notice some terminology that's familiar on this slide. So, deep sea vents. These locations support animal communities that are fueled by chemolithotrophic bacteria or microbes. Now, we've heard the term chemolithotrophic before. So this was how microbes can maintain or obtain energy. And with chemolithotrophic, the litho tells you that it was coming from inorganic materials. Now, keep in mind, if they are in deep sea hot springs, this is below the photic zone, meaning below where the light can break through the water and reach them. So you're not going to be able to have photosynthesis down here. Whereas in the other areas, we kept mentioning photosynthetic relationships. Here, you can't have photosynthesis, but what there are large amounts of is reduced inorganic materials. So these organisms, by having you know, the microbes around that can work with inorganic materials, these environments are able to sustain these types of microbes and then fix the, the inorganic materials as a carbon source. So when you see hydrothermal vent or deep sea hot springs, any of those terminologies, remember that this is where chemolithotrophic microbes will be having symbiotic relationships, that the animals here will depend on these microbes to help break down inorganic materials for these animals to survive because you won't be able to have things like cyanobacteria way down there because you're not getting light down there. And um, a lot of the things that you will see in terms of the uh, invertebrate community include the large tube worms, clams, and mussels. Now another organism found in marine and freshwater environments, and we also use them in lab settings and in, uh, in research or medical field as well, are leeches, okay? And I'm not gonna make another undergrad joke comparing you know, undergrads to leeches, but when we talk about leeches, keep in mind these guys are parasitic, okay? Parasitic annelids, and when you hear annelids, that means they are segmented worms. As you've probably heard before, especially with regard to old school medical techniques, these leeches can feed on vertebrate blood and they secrete anticoagulants and vasodilators. Now that makes sense. If you're a leech and you want to feed off of vertebrate blood, why would you want to produce anticoagulants and vasodilators? Well, you want to get as much blood as possible. You want to slurp that through your little straw mouth, right? So if you secrete anticoagulants, well, now you're thinning out that blood. You're making it easier for it to flow into your gut or into whatever, you know, uh, sucker you have as a leech. Then vasodilators, that's opening up the blood vessels. So again, it's increasing blood flow kind of like we talk about when we mention anything with immune system. You know, when you're sick, you want your body to have these anticoagulants and vasodilators because those both increase blood flow and get white blood cells to where they need. So the leeches like to increase blood flow for their own benefit in terms of drinking. Now that can be problematic for the host because sometimes, you know, too much anticoagulant or too much vasodilation can be a problem. Now, now what's funny is we think of these leeches as parasites having, you know, a symbiotic relationship with, let's say, us, but they also have a symbiotic relationship with microbes. They have microbes in their little worm body. So they have microbes in their digestive tract and in their bladder. And these microbes help them in terms of proper nutrient absorption and help supply them with things such as vitamin B12, which is, um, which is lacking basically with a, a diet 
of, um, of blood, basically. Now, the last thing I want to mention are the coral reefs, and these have actually been on the news again recently. You know, every year you hear a little bit more of problems happening in the coral reef. Now, the beautiful coral reef um, ecosystem is basically a mutualistic symbiosis between algae and simple marine animals. And what's interesting with this is the coral skeleton is basically very good at gathering light. And as we said, you know, certain areas in the water, you really want to be able to gather light sources. And then with them um, symbiotically interacting with that coral skeleton, you end up having these phototrophs, which I've mentioned before. Cyanobacteria is the big category, but they also have rhodophytes, chlorophytes, dinoflagellates, and diatoms. And when you hear things like rhodo, you think, you know, eyes, your, your eye ability, chlorophytes, you think of chloroplasts. So you're thinking of a lot of photoreceptor type um, situations. Now, the most significant of the mutualistic relationships with the coral is between sto stony coral and dinoflagellates, okay, specifically the dinoflagellate symbiodynum or dynum. Now, dinoflagellates are a large group of flagellate eukaryotes, and most are what you would call marine plankton, but some you also find in freshwater. And their populations tend to be distributed based on things like the temperature of the water, the salinity, the, uh, the depth. And in this relationship, what's important is the dinoflagellate will provide fixed carbon okay, for the corals. And the corals are invertebrate animals, mind you. You know, people sometimes see corals and think that they're little, you know, kind of like plastic toys in, in a fish tank or something. Corals are living. Corals are invertebrate animals. And the dinoflagellate bacteria, that will provide fixed carbon for these invertebrate car, uh, corals. Then the bacteria in return is getting nutrients and protection by having this nice, comfy little coral house. Okay, so it's very valuable um, mutualistic relationships. So again, like I said earlier, make sure when you see any symbiotic relationship, you ask yourself what each partner is getting out of it. So in this case, the invertebrate coral gets fixed carbon from the dinoflagellate and the dinoflagellate receives nutrients and protections. Now, unfortunately, as you've probably seen in the news, things are not all fine and dandy now. The big problem happening is what we call coral bleaching. And unfortunately, this is when the invertebrate coral loses the um, dinoflagellates. So basically, in this case, the symbiosis is lost because what you're seeing, especially with things like global warming, you're getting a much higher uh, amount of temperature and the, the change in these water conditions is causing problems for the algae or the dinoflagellates that are living on the coral. When these guys end up um, in stress, so when, when these guys, the, the algae or the, the dinoflagellate ends up stressed, it leaves the coral because that's no longer a good environment for it. When the algae dinoflagellate leaves the coral, now the coral has lost its, um, its great relationship. And it now is left to what we call bleached, where it loses its major source of food and it becomes very white and pale looking. And now you would consider it kind of like in humans when we're immunocompromised. Well, now that coral is very susceptible to, um, to, to, to disease or to uh, basically deterioration. Okay, so whenever you see those white, white coral, kind of like 
in this picture over here that tells you that that coral has lost its symbiotic relationship. The algae or dinoflagellates have left the building basically. And so the coral has lost its food source and now is sad and dying and sickly. And that uh, a big factor in that, unfortunately, is global warming, even though some government people kind of try and pretend or tell, tell the public that global warming is not a real thing, but the coral kind of prove otherwise. So again, when, again, when you review this lecture, make sure you're very comfortable with knowing the different examples of symbiotic relationships whether they're mutualistic, parasitic, uh, commensalism, uh, which you really don't find many of the commensalism uh, examples. And then make sure you're very comfortable knowing each, each member of that relationship, what their exact role is. How are they benefiting or how are they affecting the relationship partner, okay? Please head over to the discussion board, post your questions, and contact me and remind if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you and have a great day.